Hello and welcome to the next edition of the HP podcast series. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, your host and moderator for this ongoing discussion on IT innovation and how it's making an impact on people's lives. Our next big data case study discussion explores how Etsy, a global e-commerce site focused on handmade and vintage items, uses data science to improve buyers and sellers' discovery and shopping experiences. We'll learn how mining big data helps Etsy define and distribute top trends and allows those with specific interests to find items that will appeal to them. To learn more about leveraging big data in the e-commerce space, please join me in welcoming our guest. We're here with CB. He's a senior data engineer at Etsy, and they're based in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, CB. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about Etsy for those that aren't familiar with it. Uh, I've heard it described as it's like being able to go through your grandmother's basement. Is that fair? Well, I hope it's not as musty and dusty as my grandmother's basement. Uh, I think uh, the best way to describe it is that Etsy is a marketplace. We, cre we create a marketplace for uh, sellers of handcrafted goods and, and the people who want to buy those goods. We've been around for 10 years. We're the leader in this space. Uh, we went public earlier this year. Uh, just some quick little metrics. Uh, the the uh, total uh, uh, value of the merchandise sold on Etsy in 2014 was about $1.93 billion. Uh, we have about 1.5 million sellers and about 30 million buyers. So an awful lot of stuff that's of being stuff. moved around. Now, what does the big data and, and analytics role bring to the table? Well, it's all about understanding more about our customers, uh, both buyers and sellers. You know, we want to know more about them and make the buying experience easier for them. We want them to be able to find products easier. You know, too much choice sometimes is no choice. We want to get them to the product they want to buy as quickly as possible. And we also want to know how are people different in their shopping habits uh, across uh, the geography of the world. You know, there's some people in different countries that uh, transact differently uh, than we do here in the States, and, uh, you know, the big data lets us get some insight into that. And is this insight derived primarily from what they do via their click streams, what they're doing online, or are there other ways that you can determine uh, insights that then you can share among yourselves and also back to your users? Right, so uh, I'll describe our, our data architecture uh, a little bit. So we have, uh, when, when our Etsy started out, we had a monolithic Postgres database, and we threw everything in there. So we had listings, users, sellers, buyers, conversations, forums, it was all in there. Uh, but we outgrew that really quickly, and so the solution to that was to shard horizontally. So we now we have uh, you know many hundreds of uh, sharded MySQL servers, horizontal, and then we decided, well, we need to do some analytics on this stuff. And so we scratched our head. This was about five years ago. And uh, so we said, well, let's just uh, set up a Postgres server, and we'll copy all the data from these shards into the uh, Postgres server that we called BI, or BI server. And uh, we, we got that done, and then we kind of scratched our head and said, wait a minute. We just came full circle. We, went, we, we started with a monolithic database, then we went sharded, and now we're, all the data is back monolithic. And it didn't perform perform well because it's hard to get the data into that database and uh, you know a relational database like Postgres just isn't designed to do um, analytic type queries those are big aggregations and uh, you know Postgres is really single record lookup and 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 so forth so we decided hey we've got to get something else going on here we set about searching for the replacement to BI and looked at what uh, the landscape was out there about three and a half years ago and there was a number of uh, uh, very worthy products out there, but we eventually settled on Vertica for a number of reasons. Uh, one of, of which is that uh, it, it derives in um, in large part from Postgres. You know, uh, Postgres is is due to its licensing. It's got a Berkeley license, and so people can take companies can take it private. They can take that code, and they don't have to republish it out to the community. Unlike other types of uh, uh, open source um, copyright, uh, you know, agreements. So um, we found out that the parser uh, was right out of Postgres, and all the date handling uh, and uh, typecasting stuff that uh, is usually a, uh, different from database to database was exactly spot on the same between Vertica and Postgres. 
and also that the, the way of data ingestion is via this copy command is the best way to bulk load data, exactly the same in both and it's the same format. So we looked at that and said, wait, this, this looks good because we can get the data in quickly. Uh, queries will probably not have to be edited much. So that's where we went. We experimented with it and we found exactly that. Queries would run unchanged except they ran a lot faster. And we were able to get the data in. So we built some data uh, replication tools uh, to get data from the shards and also some uh, legacy Postgres databases that we had laying around for billing and stuff and get all that data into Vertica. And we built some tools that allowed our um, uh, analysts to uh, bring over data that they had, you know, custom tables they had created on this old BI machine. So we were able to get up to speed really quickly with, with Vertica and uh, boom, we had an analytics database that uh, was able to, we were able to hit the ground running with it. And uh, is the challenge for you about the variety of that data? Is it about the velocity that you need to move it in and out? Is it about simply volume that you just have so much of it or a little of some of those? It's really all of those problems. Velocity-wise, we want uh, our, our replication system to, you know, it's eventually consistent, and we want it to be as near real-time as possible. That There's a challenge in that, because you really start to get into micro-batching uh, data in, and uh, this is where we ended up having to pay pay off some technical debt, because, uh, in you know, years ago, disk storage was uh, fairly pricey, you know, and so databases were designed to minimize storage. Uh, and practices grew up around that fact, and so data would get deleted, data would get updated, and so that's the policy and, and uh, that uh, the early originators of Etsy followed when they designed the first data, database for it. And uh, so eventually what we've got now is lossy data. You know, we, uh, if someone changes the description or the tags that are associated with a listing, the old ones go away. They're they're lost forever, and that's too bad because if we kept those, we could do analytics on, hey, uh, this product all, uh, it wasn't selling for a long time, and all of a sudden it started selling. What what changed? And we'd love to do analytics on that. We can't do it because uh, of the lossy data. So that's that's one thing that we learned in this whole whole process. Uh, but getting back to your question here about uh, you know velocity and then also the volume of data. We have a lot of data from our production databases. We need to get it all into Vertica. And we also have a lot of clickstream data. You know, Etsy's a, a top 50 website, I believe, for traffic. And that generates a lot of clicks. And uh, that all gets put into Vertica. Uh, we run big batch jobs every night to load that. But it's important we have that because we want one of the biggest things that our analysts like to do is correlate clickstream data with our production data because that's the clickstream data doesn't have a lot of information about uh, the user who's doing those clicks. It's just got it's just information about their path through the through the the site at that time. And uh, in order to really get a value add on that, you want to be able to join on your user details tables so that you can know, oh, where where does this person live? Uh, how maybe how old are they? Or what's their buying history in the past? So you need to be able to join those two, and we do that in in Vertica. Give us a sense, CB, about the paybacks. Uh, when you do this well, when you've architected, when you've paid your technical debts, as you put it, um, how are your analysts able to leverage this in order to make your business better and make the experience of your users better? Well, what was uh, very interesting to us is when we first um, installed Vertica, uh, it was just a small group of analysts that were using it. Uh, our analytics program was, was fairly new, but it just sort of exploded. Everybody started to jump in on it because all of a sudden there was a database that, uh, you know, you could write, you know, good SQL with a rich SQL engine and get fantastic results quickly. You know, it, the results weren't that different from what we were getting in the past, but they were just uh, coming to us so fast. The, the, the cycle of getting information, getting result sets was so much better. That it was like a whole different world. It's like the Pony Express versus email. You know, that's, that's the kind of difference it was. Uh, and so everybody started jumping in on it. Uh, you know, engineers who were uh, adding new uh, facets of the product wanted to have dashboards more or less real time so they could monitor, hey, what's this thing doing? We, you know, we added, uh, for example, um, postage uh, to Etsy so that our, our sellers can, you know, have pre-printed labels. And uh, we'd like to monitor that in real time, see how, gee, how's this going while we launched it? Is this going well or, or what? 
And uh, that was something that took a long time to analyze before we got into big data analytics. And all of a sudden we had Vertica and we could do that for them. And there's that, that, that pattern is repeated with other groups uh, in the company, you know, we're doing different aspects of the, of the site. And then all of a sudden you got your marketing people, your finance people. Oh, wow, I can run these financial reports that used to take days and just a, in literally seconds. So all of a sudden there was a lot of demand and we've got, we're, Etsy's got about 750 employees and we probably, we've got way more than 200 Vertica accounts. So that shows you how, how uh, popular it is. And uh, just this one anecdotal story, I've been wanting to update Vertica for the past couple months and the woman who um, runs our uh, uh, analytics uh, team said, don't you dare. I've got to run Q2 numbers. I have a lot of, uh, everybody's working on this stuff. You've got to wait until this certain week in August to be able to do that. But that shows you how much, not just Vertica, but just big data is now relied on for so many things in the company. So the technology led to the culture. Many times we think it's the other way around, but having that ability to do those easy SQL uh, queries and get information opened up people's imagination, but it sounds like it's gone beyond that. You have a, a data-driven company now. Yeah, that's an astute observation that uh, you're right, that this, this is technology that has driven the culture uh, to a degree. It's really changed the way people do their job at Etsy. And uh, I think that, you know, I hear that also uh, just talking to other companies and stuff, that it, it really has been impactful. And uh, just for the sake of uh, those of our listeners who are on the operations side, um, how do you support your uh, data infrastructure? Are you thinking about cloud? Are you on-prem? Are you split between... Uh, different uh, data centers. How does that work? So I've got some um, interesting um, data points there for you. Uh, when we, um, you know, five plus years ago, we started doing uh, Hadoop stuff. We have a big, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what our current thing is in a minute, but we started out spinning up Hadoop uh, in AWS. And uh, we would uh, run nightly jobs. Basically, we collected all the search terms that were used and buying patterns, and we fed these into MapReduce jobs. And the output from that then went into uh, MATLAB, and we would get a set of rules out of that that, uh, that then uh, drove our, would drive our search engine, basically improving search. Uh, and uh, we did that for a while, and then all of a sudden we realized we were spending a lot of money in AWS. It was many thousands of dollars a month. And... We said, wait a minute, this is crazy. We could actually buy our own servers. This is commodity hardware this is going to run on. And we can um, run this in our colo facility. We'll get the data in faster because there's bigger pipes. And so that's what we did. We created what we call Etsy Dupe, which has got 200 plus nodes. And uh, we actually save a lot of money doing it that way. So that's how we kind of got into it. So we, we, we really have a bifurcated uh, data analytics, uh, big data system. We've got Vertica on the one hand for doing ad hoc queries because the analysts and the people out there, they understand SQL and they demand it. But for batch jobs, Hadoop rocks, and it's really, really good for that. But the trade-off is that those are hard jobs to write. Even a good engineer is going to not get it right every time. And uh, you know, most analysts, it's probably a little bit beyond their their reach to actually get down, roll up their sleeves, and get into to actual coding, that kind of stuff. But they're great at SQL. And, you know, we want to encourage exploration and discovering new things. And, uh, you know, we've discovered things about our business just by some of these analysts wildcatting in the database and finding interesting stuff and then exploring it. Uh, and, and we want to encourage that. That's really important. Well, you know, CB, in uh, getting to understand Etsy a little bit more, I saw that you have something called Top Trends and, and Etsy Finds, uh, ways that you can help people with affinity for a product or a craft or uh, some interest, uh, pursue that. Um, did that come about as a result of these technologies that you put in place, or did they have a set of requirements that they wanted to be able to do this and then went, went after you to, to try to accommodate it? How, how do you pull off that Etsy finds capability? Um, a, a lot of that is cross, um, cross architecture. You know, there's, uh, some of our production data is used to find that, uh, and then a lot of the, the hard crunching is done in Vertica to find that some of it's MapReduce. Uh, there's a whole um, uh, you know, mix of things that go into that. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't claim that for Etsy finds, for example, that it's all big data. There's other things that go in there. Um, but you know, definitely Vertica plays a role in that stuff. But I'll give you another example, um, fraud. 
we fingerprint a lot of our, our users uh, you know, digitally um, because we've got uh, problems with like resellers, for example. These are people who um, you know, are selling resold mass-produced stuff on Etsy. It's not huge, but it's an annoyance. And those products compete against really quality handmade products that our, uh, our regular sellers uh, uh, sell in their shops. And uh, you know, we sometimes it's a game of whack-a-mole. You you knock one of these guys down. Sometimes they're from the Far East or other parts of the world. And uh, as soon as you knock one down, another one pops up. And being able to capture them quickly really important. And we use Vertica for that. Uh, we have a, a team that works on just on that problem. Okay. Um, thinking about the future uh, with this great architecture, with your ability to do things like fraud detection and affinity uh, correlations, um, what's next? What can you do that uh, will help make Etsy uh, more uh, impactful in its, in its market and, and make your users more engaged? You know, the whole idea behind databases and, and computing in general is just making things faster, right? So when the first punch card machines came out, like in the 30s or whatever, it was also that uh, the phone companies uh, could uh, do faster billing because it was just getting out of control. I think that's where like the roots of IBM lie or, in that kind of stuff. And then as time went by, you know, you wanted, oh, well, these punch cards are slow and, uh, you know, you wanted to go on to how they develop magnetic tape. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, spinning rust disks. Now we're into SSDs, the, the flash drives. Uh, and it's the same way with uh, just databases and getting answers. You know, you always want to get answers faster. So I'll give you an example. We do a lot of A-B testing. Uh, we'll, uh, we have the ability to um, uh, set the site so that uh, you know, maybe a small percentage of users get an A path through the site and the others a, a B path. And uh, there's control stuff on that. And uh, we analyze those results. This is how we test to see if like, oh, is this kind of button work better than this one? Is the placement right? Uh, is this page, if we just skip out this page, you know, is it easier for someone to buy something? You know, what, the conversion rate and all that. And so we do A-B testing, and in the past we've done it where we've just had to you run the, the test, you gather the data, and then you kind of comb through it sort of manually. But now with Vertica, uh, the turnaround time, the time to iterate over each cycle of, uh, of an A-B test has shrunk dramatically. So you get, um, we got our data from the click streams, which go into Vertica, and then, you know, the next day we can run the uh, A-B test results on that. Now, where I'm going with this is to say that the next step, I think, really is shrinking that even more. And one of the themes that's out there at uh, you know, the various uh, uh, big data conferences are, hey, uh, streaming analytics. That's a really big thing. There's a new database out there called uh, Pipeline DB that's a fork of Postgres. It allows you to uh, create a stream uh, an event stream into Postgres. So you can then create a view and create a window on top of that stream. And then you can pump your event data, like your clickstream data, and you can join that, the data in that window to your regular Postgres tables, which is really great because in real time, you know, we could get AB information in real time instead of a one-day turnaround, it's a one-minute turnaround. I think that's where a lot of things are going. So we've got, we've had the I mean, if you just look at the history of big data, you've got MapReduce started about 10 years ago at Google, and that was batch jobs, you know, overnight runs. Uh, and then uh, and then we started getting into the, the columnar stores to make, uh, you know, the possibility of, of, of uh, databases like Vertica, and it's really great for aggregation, and that kicked it up to the next level. And I think another thing then, for going further on that, is real-time analytics. It's not going to replace any of these things, just like Vertica didn't replace Hadoop, they're complementary. Mm -hmm. I think real-time uh, streaming anal analytics will be complementary. So it's just, you know, we're continuing, continuing to add these tools to our big data toolbox. Mm -hmm. And as we compress those feedback loops, uh, if we provide that capability into a innovative, creative organization, again, the technology might drive the culture and, and who knows what sort of uh, benefits they'll derive from that. Uh, that's very true. Uh, I wanted to, to just talk for a second as you touched earlier about uh, how we do our infrastructure, you know, and so I'm in data engineering and we're responsible for, you know, making sure that our, our big data databases, databases are healthy and running right. 
but uh, we all also have our operations department, and they're they're uh, sort of in a flo floor below that's working on the you know the actual pipes and the hardware and making sure it's all plugged in, and uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a tough thing to get all this stuff you know working right. But if you've got the right people, it can happen. You know, when I mentioned earlier about AWS, the reason we were able to move off of that and save money is because we have the the people who can do it. When you start using AWS um, extensively, you know, really what you're doing is you're paying for a very high priced but good IT staff uh, at, at Amazon. And if you've got a good IT staff of your own, you're probably going to be able to realize some efficiencies there. And that's why really we moved over and, and we do it all ourselves. <clears throat> Having it as a core competency might be an important thing moving forward. Absolutely. And, you know, you've got to really stay on top of all this stuff. You know, a lot is... Uh, made of the word disruption, and uh, you know, you don't go knocking on disruption's door. It usually knocks on yours, and you better you better be agile enough to respond to it. And I'll give you an example that ties back into big data. One of the most disruptive things that has happened to Etsy is the rise of the smartphone, because when Etsy started uh, back in 2005, the iPhone wasn't around yet. The iPhone was still two years out. And then it comes on the scene, and all of a sudden, then people realize, wow, this is actually a suitable uh, uh, device for commerce. And, um, you know, all of a sudden we realize it's very easy to just be complacent and just think, okay, here's our business, and this is a real challenge for managers and management, you know, because they've got to watch out for this kind of stuff. But we started seeing, wow, uh, there's more and more commerce being done on, uh, on smartphones, and, and I think we actually kind of maybe fell a little bit behind, as a lot of companies did, uh, five years ago, and uh, but uh, our management made decisions to invest in, in in mobile, and we did that, and now, you know, 60% of our traffic is on mobile, and that's turned around, and like in the past two years, it's been pretty amazing, but big data helps us with that, because we do a lot of crunching of, hey, what exactly are these mobile people doing? It's not, mobile's not the best device, maybe, for buying stuff because of the form factor. But it is a really good device for managing your store uh, and paying your, your Etsy bill and doing that kind of stuff. And so we analyze all that stuff and crunch it uh, in, uh, in, a, in big data. And big data allowed you to know when to make that strategic move and then take advantage of it. Exactly. There's all sorts of crossover points that happen with technology. And uh, you've got to monitor it and you've got to look at your own You've got to understand your business really well to see when certain vectors are happening. And if you could pick up on those, you're going to be okay. Well, very good. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. We've been exploring how Etsy, a global e-commerce site focused on handmade and vintage items, uses data science to improve their buyers' and sellers' experience as well as their own corporate destiny. So I'd like to thank our guest. We've been joined by CB. He's a senior data engineer at Etsy, and they're based in Brooklyn, New York. Thanks, E.B. Thank you very much, Dana. And I'd also like to thank our audience for joining us for this Big Data Innovation Case Study Discussion. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, your host for this ongoing series of HP-sponsored discussions. Thanks again for listening, and come back next time.